So it is 1022. I'm going to reconvene the meeting of the Green Mountain Care Board. And I'm going to start by just taking a, a quick roll of the board members to make sure everyone is back. Um, Jessica Holmes. Yes. Robin Lunge. Yes. Tom Pelham. Yes. And Maureen Yusufer. Yes. Great. So, um, Kim, if at this time you could swear in the team from Springfield. Yes. Would you please raise your right hand? Should be four of you. Okay. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. I do. Yes. And with that, Bob, whenever you're ready to uh, begin your presentation, take it away. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I'm Bob Adcock. I am the new CEO at Springfield Hospital. And so I'm the newest um, member of the hospital leadership family in Vermont. And I'm very excited about being here uh, and having the privilege of being on the team at Springfield. You know, I want to start off by thanking the board for all the work you do for healthcare in the state. Accessible, quality, sustainable, and affordable healthcare. You know, that's a common goal that all of us should have and we should be working towards. So I applaud the work that you're doing around that for our state. So thank you for giving us an opportunity to present our budget today. Uh, before starting, I want to take a few minutes just to make some comments about the hospital and that the intense storm that the hospital is weathered here in Springfield. You know, the last two or three years have been extremely challenging for the hospital uh, which, with the Chapter 11 reorganization and the effects of the pandemic on the hospital. Um, you know, so we've reorganized. That's been a very costly process and we've also had lots of challenges around cost and volume and revenue with respect to, to COVID. Uh, but during these times, the hospital has shown a tremendous resiliency and a tremendous resolve to meet the needs of our community here in Springfield. So our slogan is where people come first, and it's really more than a motto or a slogan for us here. It really does make a difference in our organization. We have a great team of caring professionals, uh, employees, doctors. Um, we enjoy a strong community support here in Springfield. Uh, we have a dedicated leadership team and governing board and a group of quality professionals, you know, doctors and employees who, um, you know, you know, do a great job for us every day. I do want to comment on our partnership with Springfield Medical Care Systems. You know, there are FQHC in town and their delivery system. We have a strong partnership with them and we'll talk about how that's changed during since our last presentation. Um, but that's a, a certainly a strong asset for the community and for the hospital. And finally, I'd like to thank, thank Tom Eubner. Tom has been a great advisor and uh, mentor for me since I've joined the state and been, been very helpful. Um, and I also want to thank Governor Scott and uh, Secretary Smith for all of their support that they've given to the hospital through these challenging times. So next, I want to introduce our presentation team. Our interim CFO, Kata Westcott, has been in that position for about six months, and she has worked extremely hard to put together the numbers uh, in the budget for us. And also, I want to also thank our QHR partners who are also on today, uh, Chip Holmes, who is Senior Vice President, and Mike Donahue, who is their vice president. And, my, and both of these individuals uh, were very significant through the reorganization of the hospital and also continue to consult with us with respect to the operations and um, our continued turnaround of the hospital. So our thanks to them for their assistance as well. So um, Bob, is it Kata's yeah. birthday? Uh, tomorrow, I think. Oh, I see the balloons and everything quite festive. Happy early birthday, Kata. Thank you. <laughs> well, Kata's looking forward to a day off and um, she she certainly does certainly has done a great job and, and deserves it. So um, Kata, would you take over the slide duties for us, please?
Okay, so this is our introduction slide, which I think we've already covered. So if we can advance to the next slide, please. Is it advancing? <laughs> it should be. Do you not see it advancing? I'm still on slide one. Yeah, that's where um, we're all at. What about now? Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I think it would be. Uh, I. I'm not sure if, if you've had any other technical challenges with these presentations, but uh, um, hopefully that'll be our only one. So, so um, I'll start off with our hospital overview. Springfield Hospital is a critical access hospital, 25 acute and swing beds with 10 distinct parts psychiatric beds, which are located in our Wyndham Center uh, in Bellows Falls, about 10 miles from the main campus. We provide outpatient and professional services, surgery, ENT, gynecology, ortho, urology, and psychiatry, as well as our emergency department, uh, which are key services for our community. The number, I'm going to be quoting numbers that are 630 fiscal year to date, which is through our first three quarters. And if anyone has any questions about July or where we are in August, you know, we'll be happy to, to pull those numbers also. So through the first three quarters, we're running an average daily census of 9.7 on our acute service and 2.93 in psychiatry. And that does require a footnote because we did um, close admissions to our Wyndham Center, our psychiatry beds during COVID. So because we devote we devoted that unit to COVID positive psychiatric patients for the state. And so we took the unit offline and closed it and made it available only for that group, which is a, which is affecting our year-to-date census. And as we go through our budget and our volume assumptions, you'll see that we're returning the census to almost completely full, which is a reflection of the demand for psychiatric services in the state that we're seeing across the state right now. Emergency room visits, uh, we're running just under 31 visits a day, so 30.66. Um, so we're looking at about 10,000 visits this year. Surgery volume 658. And again, that is that is was affected quite a bit by COVID um, the first two quarters of the year. So our surgery is now picking back up. We have we are proud of the role we've played um, with respect to our COVID community response plans. Um, we did set up a COVID cl um, vaccination clinic and year to date, we have given 16,124 doses of the vaccine. We continue to be a major economic driver in Springfield in the surrounding area with 413 employees. Um, so good paying jobs with good benefits and uh, very important not only to the health care of our community, but to the fabric of our economy here as well. Next slide, please. I'll comment that since our last presentation a year ago, we have completed our chapter 13 reorganization. And as a result of that, the hospital and our previous parent, Springfield Medical Care Systems, um, have split into two separate organizations. We do continue to enjoy a strong partnership and um, we work together under a shared service agreement, which saves costs it allows us to strengthen services to both organizations and it also allows us to continue you know the long history of our culture and our partnership together so the both organizations emerged from chapter 11 in december we were successful in our split um, and we're also pleased that on july 7th our chapter 11 process was closed out and that is very important to us because Fiscal year to date through July, we have had about $835,000 of incremental cost that we've shouldered with respect to the reorganization trustees and legal fees around that process. 
So that $835,000 has been a huge factor in our financial picture this year as, as Cato will cover when, when we get to the financial statements. Next slide, please. So our, our budget for fiscal 21, we anticipated a good recovery from the pre-COVID levels. Um, the recovery in Springfield is now starting to catch up, but during the summer of this year, we have lagged behind the recovery that many of our colleague hospitals have seen, although we are starting to see that come back now. Um, but there is still quite a bit of uncertainty around our volume with respect to COVID, particularly with um, the, the projections that we're looking at for the Delta variant over the next, uh, particularly in September. So um, compared to FY19, we've ex experienced a 20% drop in volume across the board, primarily driven uh, by the COVID pandemic, but also a good bit of that was to drop in numbers by taking the psychiatric center offline. And those again, we, you will see when we make our volume assumptions that we are putting those back to normal levels. And I'm gonna stop and let Kata pick up on this slide and she's gonna talk about our improvements in operating income because we have experienced improvements in our operating income and sustained cost reduction strategies from previous periods, even though um, our net patient revenue has declined due to the volume drop. So I'm gonna let Kata pick up right there. Thanks, Bob. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so these last two bullets on this slide, as Bob mentioned, um, are referencing that we experienced um, an improvement in our operating margin over the last couple of years, despite the fact that our net patient revenue has declined over those last couple of years. Um, and I'm gonna advance to the next slide so we can talk about that more in detail. It's not easy doing the slides and the presentation at the same time, so bear with me. Okay, so what this slide is illustrating is that even though we have struggled over the last couple of years with declining revenue, um, COVID, Chapter 11, um, not receiving any PPP money, which Bob will talk about in a couple of slides, um, we've really made some real progress um, through what we've been calling and referencing as the perfect storm. And we've done that through managing our expenses. Um, so in this slide, you can see kind of a side-by-side -side comparison. On the left-hand side is fiscal year 20. The right-hand side is fiscal year 21 projected. Um, and the last bar in each of these years um, show our operating margin in comparison to fiscal year 19. And in fiscal year 19, we had an $8.2 million operating loss. Um, so looking at 2020 on the left-hand side, that last bar that shows 64%, what that is illustrating is that our loss in fiscal year 20 was 64% of the loss in fiscal year 19. And then looking at the right-hand side, the 21 projected um, loss, you'll see it's 48%, that's that last bar. And that is representing that our operating loss we're projecting to be 48% of our fiscal year 19 loss. So overall, that is saying that our, over, um, our operating margin has improved by about 52% um, since fiscal year 19, even with declining revenues, meaning that our decrease in expenses has been greater than our decrease in revenue. Um, and over that period of time, from fiscal year 19 to what we're projecting for the end of this fiscal year, um, there's been a, over a $5 million reduction in expenses. Um, Bob, I'm gonna turn the next slide back over to you. Okay, um, so we, hold on my, Pages have got away from me. Um, so, so our, you know, Kato's point um, is important to where we are in the lifetime of the hospital because we have made significant cost reductions. It's just that we've had also had drops in revenue due to COVID drops and, you know, 
and we've had expense increases from the reorganization cost. And so we benefit today from a number of cost initiatives that were successfully completed in the last couple of years. Um, slide six shows those. Um, so, you know, we have the closure of our childbirth center, um, labor reductions in, in staffing changes in numerous departments, changes in our employee benefits. Um, restructuring in our emergency department in our inpatient hospitalist department, and those are both changes in physician uh, staffing groups as well as anesthesia. Uh, and we've also had quite a bit of restructuring in our management staff, and one of those things was for me to come and join the team full time as a full time CEO here. Um, someone keeps calling me, so forgive me for that. So, um, so we've seen, we've continued to enjoy these expense reductions, although we have not been able to um, offset the losses in revenue. And, and we're continuing to do that. We're continue, we are continuing to look at our operating processes, um, our management of cost, and productivity, and expenses, and to ensure that we are running the hospital as efficiently as we can. And those processes will, will continue as we move forward into the new year. Um, oh, next slide, please. And this this is uh, really kind of the theme of our presentation today, and that is the, the history of the last two or three years at Springfield has been the perfect storm. Our Chapter 11 reorganization, um, in addition to, has cost a lot of money and affected the hospital pretty profoundly. Um, as well as drops in revenue and volume from COVID-19. So if we go through this slide, we'll see that the, we've had quite a bit of COVID-related decreases in our cash receipts. Um, but those are primarily driven from, from drops in volume. Um, our cost um, due to bankruptcy in our Chapter 11 have been about $4.8 million over the period, the last three year period. Um, and then the final thing is, whereas um, we, we applied for PPP funding a year ago and our round one funding was approved by the SBA. However, um, it was withheld from us due to our Chapter 11 status. Now we're appealing, we continue to appeal that ruling because we believe that we should be entitled to that funding, but we, we did not receive any PPP funding, you know, during that period of time. So that was also, um, in, it, in by not receiving the round one funding, it also disqualified us from applying for the round two PPP funding. So those were also big cash flow setbacks to the hospital in the last year. So next slide, please. The effect this has had on our cash has been pretty challenging for us. Uh, so as of July 24th, we were at, no, July 31st, uh, excuse me. As of July 31st, we had 24 days of cash on hand. Uh, September 30th, we're projecting to be at 27 and that, is being driven by a, a cost report settlement that we received in August. So um, we are we are we believe we're the lowest days of cash on hand of any hospital in Vermont, and that is uh, causing a lot of financial challenges for us every day. Next slide, please. So coming along to to our vision. I mean, again, the, the um, critical importance of Springfield and our hospital of our Spr uh, Springfield Hospital to our community can't be understated. Not only not only do we see more than 30 ER patients a day and take care of our inpatients, we provide a lot of other essential services to our community. So from a vision standpoint, you know, our vision in FY22 is to stabilize our operations. Um, you know, we want to stabilize our cash days in cash on hand 
in our operating margin, which will allow us to sustain our operations and continue the turnaround that the hospital is experiencing now. So I think that that is really our vision is to be able to stabilize our operations and continue that turnaround. Um, you know, we envision a sustainable future either as an independent hospital or as a system partner. And uh, we remain open to pursuing partnerships whenever they can improve efficiencies for the hospital and improve care and cost in our marketplace. I know prior to my arriving here, there were quite there were conversations taking place regarding partnerships for Springfield. Those um, the chapter 11 process in the COVID pandemic um, put those talks on the back burner. And, but we are still open to continuing those. Um, so, but we are do envision ourselves as as a sustainable ho hospital and critical to the health of the community. Next slide, please, Katie. So, based on our vision, we are requesting a net patient revenue increase of 7.8 percent, and that's a that is a charge increase of 8.3 percent. That increase is necessary to allow us to continue our recovery and to ensure operations remain sustainable in fiscal 22 and to continue to provide access to our essential community hospital services. Well, you know, with that, with, without this, the 7.3 percent increase in net patient revenue will put us at a projected operating margin of positive 3.4 percent and we believe that will allow us to be very sustainable in 22 and allow us to continue our recovery efforts to put the hospital on firm footing without the approval of the request i think we're going to continue to face significant financial challenges in the coming year and it will it will definitely slow our recovery process significantly Next slide, Kata. Thank you. So on slide 11 is our budget assumptions for the year. We, we are projecting 794 acute emissions uh, with 3,828 patient days. We, we are, that number is a little bit below where we um, are estimated actual in 21, and that is based on our con conservative vision of the future, not knowing how COVID impact will continue to influence the hospital and our volume. And additionally, we are in a marketplace where we're seeing significant decreases in utilization and efficiency due to the wellness efforts and population health efforts that are being made in our community. So we're, we're allowing for that in our projections going forward. We are budgeting a significant increase in swing admissions, and that's based on the lack of subacute beds in the state. You know, there are many subacute patients that are being held around the state now, and we are um, being contacted by some of our colleague hospitals to to take those patients, and we're working with them towards that goal. So we're significant significant increase there. Um, and also, again, a significant increase in psychiatric volume. Again, the Wyndham Center was closed um, most of last year, and in most of most of fiscal 21, it was closed and being held for COVID resources. And we are now returning to, you know, average daily census in the unit now is usually eight to ten, and the the difference between eight to ten and ten is usually the logistics of getting at the next patient transfer into the facility and the existing one transferred out because every hospital in the state now has psychiatric patients boarding in their emergency rooms and we have our own psych facility and we have psychiatric patients boarding in our emergency room pending placement so even though so even though we have the beds we are also experiencing that challenge that many of our colleagues are are experiencing er visits right now we're running 30.6 a day year to date and we're budgeting 31.5 in the upcoming year for a total of 11,500. Uh, we're budgeting an increase in surgical cases as well. Um, hopefully that number won't be affected by um, 
more people deferring elective cases due to the Delta variant. Next slide, please. So I think I'm going to wisely ask Kata to address the income statement. Um, before I start, is the presentation, how does that look on your side of things? Looks good here, Kata. Does it look okay? Okay. Because I can't tell if I'm in presentation mode or not. Um, but as long as you're, you guys are okay with it. Yeah, we're seeing the screen. We're not really seeing the presentation mode, but we still see it. Let me just see if I can fix that. And maybe that's what this is. Kata, Kata, this is Patrick. If you go to view at the top. Yep. And you go over to reading view. Okay. Click on that. It should improve the look of the slide. Or not. Or not. I know. I don't. <laughs> I think where you were before, if you had said from current slide, it would do it in presentation mode instead of, but now you're not on that screen anymore. Let me just try this. Yeah, try from current slide. Yeah, it's just, it's not yeah. budging. So um, we'll just have to live with this, I guess. And we um, all have uh, the printouts, so okay. I, I think that uh, anybody uh, following uh, from home without the printouts is just going to have to uh, enlarge their the specific portions of their own screen. Sure, Mom. This is Sam from the HCA. Could I just offer a suggestion? Go sure. for it, Sam. Um, so if you see in the bottom right corner where the there's the percentage bar, there's a little like projector icon to the left of it by the minus sign. Try clicking on that. I wonder if I have to, oh wait, let me see. Yep. Okay, it didn't do anything. Apologies, that always works for me, but sorry to interrupt. <laughs> I, I was very confident that that would work and I was wrong, apologies. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for the advice, but yeah. Okay, so. We'll just go with what we have here. Um, so looking at the income statement, um, if we want to focus on three quarters of the way um, down on the slide on the operating income and loss line, um, you can see that we have um, fiscal year 20 actual, fiscal year 21 projected, uh, the 21 budget, and then the 22 budget. Um, fiscal year 20, you can see we had a $5.3 million operating loss. Um, this year, we're projecting to have a $3.9 million um, loss, which is compared to just under a $700,000 profit that we had budgeted for this year. And then, um, as Bob had mentioned, for fiscal year 22, we are budgeting for a 3.4% operating margin which equates to be a $1.9 million um, operating margin. Um, another thing I wanted to point out on the income statement that might be jumping out at, at everyone is the, the second hand column, which is the fiscal year 21 projected, basically just a little bit up from the bottom, that non-operating revenue line of 18 million, again, in the fiscal year 21 projected column, that represents the gain um, from our chapter 11 exit and the release of debt, um, which we had of, of about $18 million. Um, I'm gonna go on to the next slide here. So this slide um, is on our revenue assumptions in comparison to the 21 net patient revenue budget. Um, as you can see, we've, we, we've said we, we are requesting a net patient revenue increase of 7.8%. Um, that's almost equivalent to a $4 million budget to budget net patient revenue increase from last year. Um, looking at the left hand side of this slide, what components are making up that $4 million increase? We have utilization, 
um, the rate effect and uh, debt and charity care. Um, utilization we're showing going down, the rate effect obviously going up, increasing our net patient revenue and our bad debt and charity care going down, which is increasing our net patient revenue. And um, the bad debt and charity care um, we're budgeting based on um, what we're experiencing now, which is a decrease um, from prior years. And then looking at um, the right-hand side of the slide, um, these percentages represent the payer NPR changes budget to budget um, from last year. And this is a mixture um, of our rate effect and utilization combined. Um, basically this data comes right from the workbook that was submitted um, with the Green Mountain Care Board budget submission. Um, and this comes from appendix one, table one, um, which I'm sure that you've had a chance to review. Okay. So looking at the, um, the balance sheet, um, obviously our goal is to continue to improve our financial performance since um, exiting chapter 11. And I just wanna first focus on the fund balance, which is the second line from the bottom. Um, you can see we had a negative fund balance in fiscal year 20 of 12.5 million. Um, fiscal year 21 projected, we have a $1.7 million um, fund balance, um, which is the result of exiting out, out of chapter 11 and releasing um, all of the debt, or not all of the debt, but $18 million worth of debt. So, and then in year 22, you can see that um, we're trying to strengthen our fund balance by having that three, 0.4% um, operating margin, which is gonna increase our fund balance from 1.7 to a projected $2.9 million um, fund balance. Um, going back up another line, third line from the bottom, the total liabilities, you can see that in 2020, we had $40, $40 million worth of liabilities. That's decreased by about half to 22 million um, due to the release of debt in the, the chapter 11. And then we're projecting that to decrease even more next year. Um, going kind of going backwards here, but then looking at the top hand top line, which is our cash, um, we started 2020 or we ended 2020 with about six million dollars in cash. We're projecting to end this year in 2.8 million dollars. Um, a good portion of that increase from last year is a combination of our Chapter 11 costs as well as um, our cash decline due to the lower volumes that we've experienced this year. And then next year in 22, we're projecting that pretty much to stay the same, um, which you'll see that our 7.8% um, NPR increase is not gonna change our cash levels um, from what they are now. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. So this slide is on our cash flow trending um, over the last few years. This is not your typical cash flow statement, but rather uses the EBITDA approach of, um, which I'm for sure most of you are familiar with, but takes the operating margin of in each of those years and adds back um, depreciation, amortization, and interest in order to get to EBITDA, and then. Um, from there removes our principal debt payments, um, any pension funding that's required and any capital purchases. So then looking at the bottom line, which shows the overall cash flow impact, you can see that in from fiscal year 19 to 21, we had negative cash flows each year um, improving over the other, um, but we're projecting our cash flow would have a 1.8 million dollar negative impact to cash this year. Um, looking at the last three columns of this slide um, focuses on the 22 budget and what the cash flow would look like um, if there was no NPR increase, if there was a three and a half percent NPR increase, which is that second to last um, column, and then what cash would look like with the 7.8% 
net patient revenue increase, which is what our request is. And so looking at the, um, the middle line where it says the operating margin of the $1.9 million that we talked about, which is the 3.4% operating margin, that um, brings us down to a positive EBITDA or EBITDA, however you wanna say it, of 3.2 million, which is that kind of like first blue line that you see with dollar amounts. So we have a positive EBITDA, but then when we're removing our principal debt payments, um, pension payments, and then um, much needed capital purchases that basically um, stabilizes our cash and helps us from declining, um, helps our cash from declining, which is what we've been experiencing um, recently. Um, I think that's it on this slide. So this is a slide, um, the, the heading is called charge requests, but it's on the um, net patient revenue um, increases, increases or decreases over the last few years. Um, it shows what our history has been of what was approved. Um, fiscal year 19, we actually had two charge increases approved, one at the beginning of the year, one in the middle of the year. Um, that resulted in an NPR overall increase of 1.9%. Fiscal year 20, we actually had a budget to budget um, net patient revenue decrease of 19%. Um, last year, we received a 3.5% um, NPR um, increase. Um, we had requested, I think it was a 5.3 or 5.4 last year. And then, of course, this year, um, we we're we are requesting the 7.8% um, net patient revenue increase, um, which again, this the rate increase is gonna help us to stabilize our cash and to stop the, the decline in the cash that we've been experiencing. Um, the 7.8% increase, as Bob mentioned, um, is also gonna allow us to fund um, our high priority capital needs, which Bob will talk about later on in the presentation, but. We haven't been able to fund any capital um, over the last couple of years. And then it's also going to help us to provide some cash funding into our frozen defined benefit plan, which has been frozen since 2006. Um, this is a slide continuing to talk about um, NPR um, rate requests. Um, this slide basically puts into perspective that if our if we had a three and a half percent NPR increase each year from fiscal year 19, what our fiscal year 22 um, request would be if we had a three and a half percent increase each year, and it would be $67 million, um, when our actual request this year is $54.5 million. So that's a $12.5 million difference um, than where we would be if we did have a three and a half percent increase in each of those last three or four years. Um, continuing to talk about our um, NPR um, rate increases and what that does to our cash. Um, this is kind of a repeat of the previous slide that we just talked about with the, the cash flow trending. Um, this slide emphasizes um, that the 7.8% 7 .8 is really critical to sustain our operations because as it illustrates in the last column and what I talked about in the previous slide is that it's just allowing us to stabilize our cash and stop the decline. Um, I do hear some background noise. If I could just ask anyone who is not speaking to mute their uh, screen, it would be great. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, and the first two columns, the first column shows what our cash would look like with no increase. And then the second column um, with a three and a half percent increase, um, which are showing to be negative cash flows um, with a three and a half percent increase. If you look at the EBITDA line of one, basically one million, it says 1066. 
it's positive, but it's not even enough to cover um, our principal debt payments and wouldn't allow us to fund um, much needed capital as well as fund um, our pension plan. So going on to the next slide on other operating revenue and non-operating revenue, um, we're talking about the major components of what makes up those areas in other operating revenue. The, the biggest item is our adult day program, which we're budgeting to be fully operational next year. Um, our adult day program was closed um, post COVID and was closed for most of this year and just opened up back again at the beginning of July. Um, so we're budgeting that to be fully operational. We're also budgeting um, over 800,000 for our shared services agreement with Springfield Medical Care Systems, which Bob talked about. Um, we continue to share overhead um, with the FQHC. And then lastly, for other operating revenue, we are hoping that we'll get some COVID grant funding, um, whether it be state or some other kind of funding to offset some of our COVID related costs that obviously we're still experiencing. Um, we're budgeting to have over $500,000 in actual COVID cost, um, which is a combination of uh, supplies and testing. So we're hoping that um, there will be some grant funding out there to offset some of that cost. Um, fiscal year 21 revenue not budgeted, not budgeted in fiscal year 22. We had, um, while our inpatient psych unit was operating as a COVID unit for the first six months of this year, we got state um, grant funding to um, cover the cost of operating that unit. Um, we're not budgeting that for next year. Um, we also received some state grant money this year to support our adult day service while that was closed. Um, that was to cover the fixed costs of the facility. We're not budgeting that next year. And then um, we also got some, some state grant money to support our holding the vaccine clinics. Um, so none of that we're budgeting next year. And then non-operating revenue, um, obviously we're not budgeting to have another gain from chapter 11. Um, that was obviously a one-time thing. Um, so that's not being budgeted for next year. And then we are budgeting to have a $750,000 um, pension plan expense for um, next year, which is consistent with this year. Or I should say not this year, but last year. So moving on to operating expenses, um, just focusing on the bottom line, um, looking at the the far right hand column, which is the 22 budget. Um, we're budgeting to have a $55 million um, operating budget. Um, that's a $3.3 million increase from the 21 budget, um, which is six and a half percent. But compared to where we're projecting to be this year, that's only a one and a half million dollar increase, or which is um, equals a 2.7% increase. And then looking at the first column, you can see our expenses in 2019 were 58 million. Um, so our expenses um, have dropped over the last few years. We've removed costs out of our system by over $3 million over that period. This slide is kind of just a summary of what I just talked about. Um, the operating expense budget comparisons, um, I, I, just to say again, we're budgeting $55 million operating budget uh, compared to the fiscal year 21, that's an increase of 3.3 million. And then the main reasons for our increases, um, primarily staffing um, is the big one. Um, and then going up to the bottom line, um, COVID-19 costs, we had not budgeted for those in fiscal year 21. Um, but those are pretty significant that we actually realized. Um, so we are budgeting for those this year. And as I mentioned, those are about a half a million dollars. Um, and then compared to the fiscal year 19, the pre-COVID period, our expenses have dropped over $3 million. Um, 
Um, continuing to talk about operating expenses, our labor costs represent about 62% of our operating budget. Um, we are budgeting for a 2% COLA increase this year. Um, over the last couple of years, um, last year we did a 2% COLA in December. The year before that, we weren't able to do so while in Chapter 11. And then in fiscal year 19, we had to stop during the year because um, of our Chapter 11 status and not being able to, to afford it. Um, we did have, like the other hospitals, have had significant traveler costs in fiscal year 21. Um, July year to date, we are over budget in traveler costs by $1.2 million. Um, we are still, so while we didn't budget much for that in fiscal year 21, we are budgeting for that in fiscal year 22, although um, at a lower cost or at a lower expense than what we've experienced this year. Um, we're also budgeting to reinstate our 401k match to employees, which we haven't been able to do since the beginning of 2020. Um, we're hoping that's going to um, help with the, the workforce challenges and helping to attract um, employees to our system. And then looking at the, um, the operating and total margin, obviously this ties back to the income statement that we looked at previously. Um, you know, just reiterating um, our operating margin that we're budgeting for is the $1.9 million, which is a 3.4% operating margin. Um, that's after experiencing significant losses the last few years. Um, and then our total margin um, is a little bit less, $1.2 million, and that's because of the estimated impact of our um, frozen defined benefit plan. And Bob, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you, Kata, um, for that. That was a very, very thorough job. Thank you. Um, just kind of setting the stage on, on fiscal year 22, looking at our risk and opportunities for the hospital. Again, we still have lots of um, unknown issues around what will what will the future and continued impacts of COVID be on the hospital in terms of operating cost, impacts on reducing revenue, and increased cost around you know staffing and travelers and premium pay and those type of things. So I, I would, but again, I, I would have to say our biggest risk for the year is our first one. It's our continued declining cash reserves, and so. Um, that's certainly an area that we would like to, to address here with this budget submission. Workforce volatility continues continues to be an issue. I do believe we're making some progress now. As Kata mentioned, we had over a million dollars um, of additional cost in travelers last year, and we are managing those down now. And so now I believe right now, today, I think that we have three travelers in the whole building working for us right now. And some of those travelers have been replaced by our successful recruitment of international staff. Um, we have um, five international staff working for us right now and four more that we've contracted for that we are expecting to join us. Uh, they have not been able to come due to, um, you know, due to COVID, but as soon as we can get them released, we will, we will continue to drive down our travelers. And we're doing that by bringing in international staff to supplement our own staff. Utilization continues to be a challenge um, in, in a world that is still mostly fee for service. Uh, improvements in efficiencies and population health are reducing utilization. Uncertainty over federal and state health care reform initiatives. Um, competition in the delivery system. And again, recently in the last quarter, I think I think our hospital as well as other hospitals have seen an increase in inflation due, you know, from the general economy overall. So I th think those are our risks upcoming for the year. On, on the other hand, I think it's balanced by a number of opportunities. Uh, swing bed utilization is certainly an area that we're budgeting an increase for in the year. I think a reoccurring theme that I hear all over the state is a shortage of, of post-acute beds, and we 
can um, we, we believe that we can increase our swing bed census in that area and also help our colleague hospitals with some of their discharge planning difficulties. We will we are planning on running the inpatient psychiatry unit as close to full as we can during the year. And uh, again, we have people waiting in every hospital emergency room in the state for scarce psychiatric beds. And so we're, we're expecting to run that unit as full as we can this year. Adult daycare is back online now. And we view that as a area to reduce skilled nursing and nursing center um, patients. So maybe some patients could continue to live independently if they take advantage of our adult daycare services as compared to being in a nursing facility. General surgery, we have gone the last couple of years with only one general surgeon and supplementing on call for that doctor with locums coverage. We are recruiting a second general surgeon this year and we have that budgeted sometime around mid-year. Do not have the person identified and contracted with yet, but we're optimistic that we can implement that around mid-year. Our emergency department volume is continuing to grow towards returning to normal. Again, we're at 30.66 year to date in 21, and we're budgeting 31.5 in fiscal 22. Um, we're at 38 visits per day, month to date in August. So. Um, Again, I mentioned earlier that our, our return to volume has been a little slower than some of our colleagues in the state, but we are now seeing that pick back up in the, in the emergency department for sure. We are looking, doing a feasibility study right now on a pain management program. There's not one in Springfield, and we believe that a number of our patients would benefit from that, but we are looking at the financial feasibility and how we would organize and deliver that service right now. Next opportunity is around our community needs, health needs assessment. We are beginning the process to do that uh, for the year. So we'll commence that process in September. And you know, we're looking forward to getting updated results on what are the healthcare needs of the greater Springfield area and comparing that to the services that we offer to make sure that we are meeting the needs of our community and fulfilling our mission here. And out of that community health needs assessment, we will also do a new strategic plan in fiscal 22, to uh, which will be our initiatives and programmatic areas to, that will address the community, the opportunities from the community health needs assessment. Um, talked a little bit earlier about affiliations. I mean, affiliations are very important, uh, you know, for in, in America right now in our changing healthcare market affiliations you know, are, are a pretty important thing that's going on and I anticipate that we will re-engage in discussions about those. You know, we remain open to, to any partnerships that improve quality, reduce cost, and, um, you, know, you know, guarantee access to health care in, in the Springfield area. And our final opportunity, I think, is around our revenue cycle function. Um, we, we have a hospital improvement program going on now focusing around our business office and, and how we bill and collect, and we think that will be an opportunity for us as well in the upcoming year. Next slide, please. Specifically addressing our participation in, in value-based care, um, you know, Springfield Hospital does fully participate in One Care. Um, in the last fiscal year, uh, we were in the program for Medicaid and Blue Cross, and we were we were going to continue that. We've signed the contracts this week with One Care. We will continue in fiscal 22 to participate in the Medicare in the Blue Cross ACO as a result of those agreements. We are again. I want to point out that. We are a critical access hospital and that our that um, you know ha gives us a little different impact on our Medicare funding as a result of that. Next slide, please. Kate mentioned earlier in the cash portion of the budget, our capital needs. 
during the pandemic in chapter 11, we have not been able to fund any significant capital investment in the hospital. And um, so the last couple of years, a lot of things have gone wanting. We have submitted a preliminary capital budget of $1.4 million, which addresses a number of priority areas for us. Replacement equipment in lab in the imaging department, equipment in surgery, and in our, our central plant, HVAC equipment to keep our air conditioning up to date and as energy efficient as possible. Next slide. Again, re-emphasizing re the impact that COVID has had on the hospital. Again, it had a significant impact on our volume across the board. And when the budget was done last year, the, a, um, you know, a, a budgeted, the volume was budgeted to increase. And again, it, and that volume did not pan out due to the continuation of the pandemic. Cash flow has has been challenged and uh, a challenge for us the last couple of years. Again, we have lots of stress on our clinical workforce, as I'm sure you probably heard from many of our colleague hospitals around the state. Not only is it challenging to recruit staff for our hospitals, but if when we do recruit staff, we have some other challenges around housing. Um, you know, affordable housing in our area is is a challenge. And I think it's a challenge across the state. So that is a barrier to recruiting people, particularly when they come from out of the area. I have experienced that myself in my own difficulties with with uh, access to housing since I've moved here. Um, workforce shortage and increased travel cost. Those are those have had a big impact on us during the COVID challenge. I think we're starting to come out of those now. I'm I'm optimistic about those supply chain challenges and again now I think that we should also mention inflation around around the supply chain area which is we're starting to see now and of course overall increased cost and volatility when we when we reduce elective procedures in the hospital you know that really affects a lot of revenue in the hospital so we have increased cost around staffing um, you know staffing and PPE and supplies but yet we have you know, higher margin elective procedures um, being deferred. And again, I'll mention, I'll men I will mention again, you know, that we did give si over 16,000 COVID vaccination um, doses here. So we're pretty proud of our vaccination clinic. It did take our adult daycare offline while we did it because that was the location we used. Next slide, please. Wait, I missed. Hold on one second here. I missed. I missed a slide. So our um, our concluding comments again, we're request we are requesting a net patient revenue increase of 7.8 percent and we recognize how that compares to our colleague hospitals in the state. But this is justified based on the needs to continue our overall hospital recovery and to and support sustainable operations in the year going forward. The 7.8% will allow us to sustain operations and allow us to um, complete our needs of survey, you know, look at programmatic and initiatives that will strengthen the hospital on a long-term basis and, you know, do the things we need to do to put the hospital in a position to be stable long-term and available for the community. So, so in concluding, you know, we need the we need to continue our recovery uh, to support sustainable operations to continue to provide essential hospital services. Again, you know, more than 30 people a day seek care in our emergency room. Um, if those services were not available, then there would be geographic barriers, particularly during the wintertime um, due to the geography of our area. Um, the economic stability for our community and for our region. And then we we do need to do some capital funding to keep our hospital physical plant up to date and our equipment up to date and to fund our frozen defined benefit plan. With, you know, without without this increase, we will FY22 will be a year where we will continue to face financial 
for challenges. Next slide, please. So the sustainability and success of the hospital is essential to the health and welfare of the community and to achieve our ongoing success, you know, we respect, respectfully request our rate increase. So that concludes our presentation. Super, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Kata. And we're going to start the uh, board questions first with board member Yusufer Maureen. Uh, thank you. And first, I really want to start out that I really appreciate, you know, all your efforts that you're doing during the pandemic and working your way, you know, out of Chapter 11. Um, you know, I appreciate you have new team members and, you know, obviously you're doing a lot of hard work and you put a lot of hard work into this presentation. Um, but I got to tell you, I am extremely concerned of your ability to meet the forecast that you have put together here. Um, I'm not concerned so much about your rate increase, the 8%. I'm going to put that aside for a second. Um, I do not see way for you to get the 7.8% NPR that you're requesting. Um, part of the historical issue with Springfield has been aspirational top line forecasting and then the inability to cut expenses to meet the revenue. And this has created significant losses. And I don't see a way that this isn't going to happen again. And I, I want to, you know, I've got to walk through a lot of the financial statements and a lot of the slides, but starting first with page 17, um, I just want to ground things a little bit into you know, what was approved and what happened. So on page 17, which is how you were working off your three and a half percent increases, and I don't know if you can put this slide up for other people, I have it in front of me. Um, you absolutely started with a $60.5 million approved budget, but you came in at $47.4 million at that time. And so when we were ta when we're talking about um, aligning back to a base and where we're telling everybody, you know, start from 2019 as a base, it's certainly not at an approved level. It's at what did you achieve in 2019? So I want to, you know, just try to level set some things. And I do appreciate we have new people. I appreciate, you know, I know you're trying. I'm, I'm just saying. So, so even right there, if you take the 47.4 and that disparity, you can see the 60.5 versus the 47.4, huge myth, right? So then if you carry that forward by your three and a half, three and a half, three and a half, you'd be at 52.5 million. So that's just one data point because I, do, I don't want it to look like your 12 and a half million decrease to the request. You're absolutely not. You're two and a half million over. So when we're talking level setting, it has nothing to do with the forecast that was totally missed in 2019. It has to do with um, where you ended up. So that that's just to kind of start there. The next piece, when you talk about trying to get a 7.8% increase, that alone doesn't sound too bad, except it's a 21% increase off your current projection, the highest by far of any hospital request this year, even with other hospitals requesting large commercial rate increases. So UVM requested an 8% increase similar to what you are requesting. And they're up 15.7% to their projection with population adjustments and various other things. So I'm, I'm just trying to benchmark because it's, it's you know, you can put out a 7.8% increase. We could approve a 7.8% increase. That doesn't mean you're going to hit it. Um, the next page I want to go to is page, uh, is the commercial rate increase because I think that's where you have um, on page 13, the largest issue in reconciliation, or I have a really hard time reconciling this number. Um, I don't start at a gross payment because that's not what's, that's not where commercial or Medicaid or Medicare is gonna start, right? We, we can say we charge $100 gross, but if, our deductions are 50 and commercial pays 50, then any increase is, is not off the gross. 
it's going to be or an 8% increase on commercial is going to be off the rate that they pay. They, they don't really care where we where you started from. So just from that, you have a $45 million forecast currently in 21. 29 million of that is commercial. That's your net commercial that you're expecting right now. 8% of that is $2.3 million. You clearly say Medicare and Medicaid does not participate in the rate increase, and I totally agree with that. You may get some payment increases for Medicare. So I really am having a hard time and will need to have support either an answer after to this question on how you get $6.1 million on a rate increase. I mean, even if you take your whole net this year, it's $45 million, right? That you'd need over a 10% increase, about a 15% increase on that to get $6.1 million. Um, so I guess that's that's really the first question, and it might need a follow up. But if you're, you know, again, we're only approving potentially an eight percent increase on commercial, and if we do that, it show me the math of how that can possibly yield six point one million dollars. I don't think it can. So. So I'm going to ask um, Mike Donahue, would you mind speaking to this? Yes. I, um, my background's in reimbursement and um, this, this budget is a standard approach to projecting a budget. Our commercial account uh, will be subject to scrutiny, of course, and the fact is, is that we are planning to uh, open, if we get the approval, we are planning to open negotiations with our commercial payers and insist on uh, demand and increase in reimbursement from them due to the fact that over the past several years, we've suffered greatly in terms of uh, reimbursement from them. And I may not be able to explain it clearly to you, but I don't recall in the past, since 2019, when I've been um, advising the hospital, any negotiations with even Blue Cross in terms of um, attaining better, more improved reimbursement. So our goal is to first seek approval from you and then to go and reopen negotiations with our commercial vendors, our payers. And, 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 I, and I want to be really clear. Simple. Yeah, I, I want to make, I want you guys to be successful. So I'm not trying to be this difficult, um, but this is where it got us in trouble before. And again, you'll really have to show, I'm not even pushing back right now on the 8%. Say you get the 8% increase. Your commercial revenue is $29 million. So to get $6 million off of $29 million um, is not an 8% increase. Um, that's significantly higher than that, right? That's a 20% increase. That We're not approving a 20% increase, so that's not going to be possible to negotiate. Well, it would be pretty miraculous if you could turn a, an 8% charge you know, rate request on a $29 million base into $6 million. And, and so I really, we're gonna need to get back on that because again, should we then just reduc reduce that $4 million from your top line? Um, you know, then, then we'll start looking at the expenses that would need to cut in order to have you have a bottom line yeah. operating problem. So again, I'm not trying I to, you know, I, I you guys have been through this before, maybe not this team, but we've been through it before. And, and shame on us that. for putting, you know, $60 million in 2019. And I know I pushed back on that one saying it was too high as well. But, um, you know, and again, I'm, I'm also trying to align you with the all the other hospitals. You're at a 21% increase with other hospitals having similar numbers um, year over year. So it, it just doesn't right. tie together. Um, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. And I, uh, I, I agree with with the idea that 
um, we may not make it in terms of being able to um, meet every goal that we have, but the opportunity for the hospital is that we have a need, a cash flow need to, to, uh, to be able to project significant cash coming out of uh, the last couple of years to be able to sustain operations. If we don't meet our goals, then we won't we won't be able to meet our cash flow goals either. Absolutely, and, and that's why that's absolutely. if we requested a seven point eight percent NPR, or we requested something less, it would be even worse. It wouldn't be better. It would be worse. If I if we came in with a twenty percent increase. We, we would be laughed, laughed out of the meeting. So well, this, this one is based on our actual cost projected and in increasing volumes in the psychiatric unit and in the acute unit to be able to achieve those goals. And you actually are asking for a 20% increase over your budget. And Again, it's, you know, at the end of the day, if we do nothing, if we do nothing as the Green Mountain Care Board and say you can have this forecast, you go ahead, go for your 7% increase. It's not seven, it's 20. It won't happen and you'll be in far worse shape. It'll be what's happened in the past. I mean, I don't think we're gonna be able to answer this. You're gonna have to follow up because you're not supporting how you're gonna get there. And, and that would be the second part of this would yeah. be really to bridge you know, you you guys have bridged your increase over your your budget. Um, well, your budget is obsolete, and your budget is down from what was, um, you know, a budget of fifty million to forty five million. So you need to bridge the forty five million dollar NPR that you have this year to the fifty five million dollars that you have for next year, a twenty one percent increase clearly laying out where you're getting a 6.1 million rate on an 8% increase on half of the volume, right? That's $2 million. So there's $4 million right yeah. there. I can't see, and I'm gonna say it has to come off just by math. And then additionally, you know, where you'll be, you know, where you will end up. Yeah. Because the, the um, other we, side is- We appreciate have to come that. Down in order I'm to sorry, use. I'm sorry. Yeah, two people speaking at once. Go ahead, Maureen. Yeah. Well, the, their expenses will have to come down to align with what's really going to happen on the top line, or you will lose a lot of money, and will be, and you won't be successful. I'm, again, I'm doing this to try to say, someone's got to convince me, and maybe the other board members will feel the same way on what you know these this forecast. Uh Maureen, we appreciate your comments and we want to work with the Green Mountain Peer Board on this. And if we need okay. to submit additional documentation, we are um, open to having you work with us. We appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Maureen, could I interject for a second? Sure. I think, uh, Mike, what we really need to see is some type of um, statement that shows how you arrive at 6.1 million dollars from the the uh, change in charges because maureen's right i mean you're, you're talking about um even with some improved uh you know uh efforts uh on your operations as far as bringing in additional revenue you're only talking about two and a half million dollars with an eight percent increase and so mm -hmm. i think that uh we're struggling and you can see that uh struggle in, in maureen's question so if you could Mm -hmm. you know, um, give us some type of uh, projection that actually shows how you're ever possibly going to get to that 6.1 million. It would be very helpful. Yes, we will We will go back and sharpen up pencils and provide you with the schedule and work papers to, do, to show you that. And, and for instance, this chart we need to do off of, off of your current forecast. And when you would do that off of your current forecast, um, which is 45 million, it's a $10 million increase. The bad debt and charity care wouldn't be in that reconciliation because it 
that improvement was from your budget this year to your forecast this year, your forecast this year to next year, that goes away. So you would have to, so utilization is up as well as, as rate. And I, it's just not supported in my mind. Again, I'm not right now even touching the rate. I'm saying, assume you get the 8% rate, but I, I, I do not see, and I'm not saying we're going to prove that, but I'm just saying I'm taking that out of the equation. I, I do not, you know, I just think by what, you're not going to get there. So then moving to page 12, which is the income statement. Um, and, you know, this is a little bit more, more challenging because, of course, we've had COVID. So I, 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 you know, I totally understand that. But what we are seeing once again is the decline in revenue. Um, the $5 million decline in revenue with a $2 million increase in um, operating expenses, which then becomes $2 million more increase in operating expenses in your 22 budget. So, you know, that's, I don't think that's going to be supported if you can't get the revenue that you're asking for. And again, you can ask for revenue, but you need the patients to come in the door. So just because we approve it doesn't mean it will happen. And that's what has happened in the past. We've approved numbers that you haven't achieved. Um, so what areas would you be able to cut? I'm looking at management contract services. That was up significantly from budget to projection, and then that holds and then salaries and wages, because assuming you're going to need to cut, you know, $4 million or more out of your operating expenses in order to meet your cash flow needs, um, would you be able to identify areas you'd be able to cut? So just to point out on the management and contracted services, um, um, that is up this year compared to what we budgeted because um, our hospitalist program was previously um, staffed by our own employees and that we changed that at the beginning of this year. So that's a contracted service that's ending up um, when the hospitalist providers um, were under our employment, that line item was under physician fees now being, and that's where they were budgeted. Now this year, after we changed over to having that as a contracted service, that line is showing up or that expense is showing up under management and contracted services. Um, so just wanted to point out why it looks like that is up, but physician fees um, are down as a result. And just as a reminder, um, we have, um, we've worked really hard over the last couple of years to decrease our expenses. Um, as I mentioned, expenses are down at the end of this year, $5 million from where they were um, two years ago. And um, next year, um, you know, that's projecting to, to increase from where we're ending up this year. Um, but we have a lot of costs that we didn't have before. We have COVID, um, COVID related costs, and those are expensive. Um, travelers, which we did not anticipate, um, like I said, they were a million dollars over budget this year. Um, so Internally, it's it's going to be difficult to when we've already worked so hard to reduce our expenses um, to you know to to find areas to do that even more. Um, and to point out on the net patient service revenue of forty five million dollars this year, compared to our budget of next year, we also have to remember that the first six months of this year we had no revenue for our inpatient psych unit because that was a COVID unit. There's no revenue for that in the first six months of this year because that was um, funded by state grant money, which is showing up on the other operating revenue line. So next year, one of the reasons why net patient revenue, one of the components of that is that our um, inpatient psych unit is fully operational um, for next year and at close to full capacity. So I just and wanted to point out- Is that worth? What's that? How, how many dollars is that worth? Um, shoot, I don't have that off the top of my head. I'd have to get back to you on that. And it that, two years ago, you lost $9 million. So that's why you needed to cut all those expenses. Um, and it's, 
it's you know you know it's it's not enough uh, to support what you're going to need for 22 in my mind. Um, so I mean I I mean I have other questions on the basis, but I'm I'm going to um, you know let other board members discuss this and you know I you know we're really going to need some reconciliation at least from my mind to support that increase. Um, in your NPR requested. And again, it's because I just want to be really clear from my point of view, it's because I don't want you to end up in the same situation. This is an aspirational budget from what I'm looking at. You're not going to make it. It's going to come in debt lower on net patient revenue. Your expenses will be equal or higher and you're going to lose more money and you're not going to have cash. So it's, it's pretty dire in my mind. And it has nothing to do with whether we approve what you're doing, but what, what, whether we approve or not is not going to have any implication on what actually happens. Um, so, but, but I'm all set, Kevin. I just we'll need some follow-ups. Thank you, Maureen. Next, we'll go to Board Member Holmes, Jessica. Yeah, hi. Um, well, thank you very much for the presentation. I know it's been a tough year or two for all hospitals, but especially for Springfield. Um, I do appreciate all the cost initiatives you've undertaken. I appreciate the work coming out of you know bankruptcy that that must have entailed, um, as well as the efforts to deal with the pandemic. So it's quite a year, uh, quite a year to come to Vermont, Bob. But welcome. <laughs> to Vermont. I hope you found housing. Um, I did. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. Um, but hate to he think you were like living in your office or something like that. Um, so you know, I, I'm not gonna. I'll just say that I share Maureen's concerns about hitting your NPR target. Uh, if you don't make it, obviously it'll be another loss since your expenses are aligned with that aspirational top line, at least as as I see it. And I I hear the 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 uh, concern in Maureen's voice as well. So I'll look for that follow up. I'm not going to go down that line too far. Um, but let me ask you a, a related question about uh, what's happening and what's driving some of this. Rural bypass is a, is a common contributor to rural hospital kind of insolvency. And as you know, this is when residents drive by their local hospital and seek care elsewhere. You've got five hospitals within an hour of your community. So is this something that you track where your residents are going? Could this be a growing factor in your declining utilization and financial distress? Are you tracking your HSA, where the residents in your community are going for care? And has that changed in the last two or three years? Well, we have we have started looking at our patient out migration. Um, the numbers that I have seen Although I haven't had an, I haven't had the time to spend with that that perhaps I would have liked. The numbers I've seen so far, um, those numbers don't appear to have changed very much the last couple of years. But I haven't had time to really analyze those in more detail. It is true that we are sending a lot of tertiary patients to higher level of care, and and so that those are things that we don't have the capabilities for to take care of here in Springfield. Um, but there are also things that we can take care of. So one of the things we need to do is to win the confidence of the community back after the struggles that the hospital has. And that is part of our strategy for FY22 to re-engage the community and to line up the services that we have available with what is needed and to win the confidence of the community back. Well, let me ask you a related question. Since utilization has fallen, for maybe a host of reasons. How do you ensure that you now have enough volume to ensure that you can ensure quality, particularly in areas where general surgery and joint replacement and things like that, where there is a volume quality relationship, your utilization is falling. Utilization was low in those areas to begin with. How do you ensure quality? Well, we, we are continually, our medical staff is continually monitoring, you know, the outcomes on the surgical outcomes and the procedural outcomes. And um, I understand that there's always going to be a relationship between volume and competency, but we we don't feel we're we don't from what I can tell four months into my journey here, I don't see that that we have an issue with that. Um, so, you know, your rate request, your your NPR you know request of seven point eight percent really is driven by 
the rate request, right? The 8.3% change in charge request, since we know that utilization is actually fall, falling. And it's, it is worrisome. I'm not going to, again, echo all of Maureen's concerns, but it's this isn't even going to improve your cash position. You're still going to be at 20, 22 days, ca days cash on hand with an 8.3% rate increase if that's given to you. So I have to be a little blunt as well. I mean, this is a really high rate request. Um, we look at Springfield's rate requests the past few years, you've been above the state median, yet you're still generating losses. Um, relying on increases in commercial rate, as Maureen pointed out, does not seem to be, you know, a kind of a strategy here. Um, it's not going to generate the kinds of revenue that are likely to get you back in, you know, good financial standing. So I guess my tough question to you here is, at what point does Springfield have to reimagine its service lines, its underlying cost structure, and really think about what is the appropriate size of Springfield Hospital. I mean, is it possible that your fixed costs, as they currently stand, simply really can't be met by the declining patient demand, whether that's because of rural bypass or population decline, or your proximity to five other hospitals? But at some point, when, when do you start to think about the service line offerings and the fixed costs and reimagine that? Well, I think that's a process that we that I have to engage in with my team now that I've arrived in looking at those, you know, in the in the year going forward. Our community needs assessment will be part of that. It'll be looking at what services are needed in the community and then compare those to what we are offering and can we offer the services that we're offering with a sustainable margin. And I think that's part of a process that our team has to go through that I have to lead as the new person here. Yeah, and I recognize you're new and you've inherited what, you know, the service line mix that's there. But I hope that that service line optimization analysis incorporates, you know, what's down the road being offered at Escutney and what's, you know, around the corner at, at Dartmouth, Hitchcock and Brattleboro and Grace and Rutland. I mean, so to the degree that we're really thinking about uh, a rational healthcare delivery system and making sure that we don't duplicate services and have high fixed costs associated with all of these, you know, specialties and service lines. I think that's part of hopefully what some of those potential affiliation talks that you're, you know, thinking about as an opportunity. I could imagine if there's some affiliation and there'll be some shared services and some reduction in some of that overhead, um, which might be the better avenue, I think, for Springfield Hospital then continually trying to increase it through commercial rate because I just don't I don't see it either. Um, my last point is really, and I've been making this with all the other hospitals. So in in, in fairness, it's about this Mathematica study um, and you know the potentially avoidable utilization that they they've done an analysis of at rural hospitals and they shared some of those results a few weeks ago. Again, these results are only for fee for service, but almost a third of Springfield's inpatient ED volume is potentially avoidable, according to their analysis. And again, that's higher than the state median. So I'm wondering if these numbers are surprising to you. Do you track this yourself? And what can the hospital do to bring down some of this potentially avoidable utilization, particularly since it's relatively high compared to other hospitals in the state? Well, again, with me being new, I didn't have when I when I saw the data, I didn't have an assumption around what it would be, so it was new to me. I think from my perspective, I'm going to have to look at the data and understand where it comes from and what time periods it includes. Um, I can tell you we have we're making a lot of efforts around looking at operation how we operate the hospital and some of the things we are looking at as part of our revenue cycle is our throughput and our you know, case management and care management functions. So we have initiatives that we're working on around a lot of those areas now. We've recently received a grant to put a social worker in our emergency room. And so I think that that's going to also give us a little more, you know, ability to focus on some of that. Sure. But yeah. but I think from my standpoint, it's, it's, I have seen the data, but I need to understand it better before I have a conclusion regarding it. Is that something you're going to start to track then? within the hospital tracking the potentially avoidable utilization well absolutely i think i think that is that is a key, key metric you know every hospital has a set of metrics that are critical to the hospital being successful so from looking at these numbers it appears that should be one we should be 
focusing on and analyzing and managing. All right, well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And again, I know it's been a tough welcome to Vermont, but I, <laughs> but I hope you know you're enjoying your your stay so far. Thanks. Kevin. I am I am I am enjoying being here. Everyone has been very welcoming to me since I've arrived. So thank you. Well, good. And actually, fall foliage is beautiful. So you're about to see one of the you know most amazing parts of our you know climate up here in Vermont. So I hope you enjoy that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Next, we'll turn to board member Lunch, Robin. Thank you. Uh, yes, I want to welcome everyone else's. I wanted to echo everyone else's welcome to you, Bob. And um, I'm I recognize really the challenge that you and your team have taken on in terms of uh, trying to ensure Springfield's sustainability. Um, I don't have a one of the benefits of being kind of towards the end is a lot of my questions have been answered. So I just had a couple. Um, uh, in terms of your, I know your PPP loan uh, wasn't successful because of the Chapter 11 bankruptcy. I wonder if you could just give us a sense of, if you have a sense of how long those appeals generally take, and if you were successful, um, kind of the level of magnitude that you'd be requesting. OK, well, yes, we, we have appealed that ruling with the SBA and I do not. As far as I know right now, we don't have a, a, a firm court date, but we're expecting it, expecting it to be in the fall. So I'm thinking like October or November. And I'll have to defer to, to uh, Kata on the amount. Our original um, loan request was three million dollars. Great. And do you and you may not know the answer to this, which is, uh, you know, obviously fine. So if you were able to put in your loan request, would that also allow you to put in for the second round or at this point, it's really that's just too late? That is a good question. I do not know the answer to that. OK, I, I know curious. that I know that being being um, deferred on round one stopped us. It made us ineligible yeah. for round two, so I'm not sure if we'll be able to file that retroactively or not. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, and then really my only other, it's really a suggestion in terms of follow up, and I know our staff will work with you on this, but I think um, to more to some of Maureen's and Jess's questions, I think having the dollars with uh, the parts of your revenue increase that um is related to the inpatient psych or the adult day uh, having an understanding of those dollars in terms of how that fits into the whole would be helpful for me as well and i look forward to uh, additional information on the charge request and that's all i had thank you so much thank you robin next we're going to turn to board member pelham tom well, thank you for your presentation, and my wish for you is that uh, in two or three years from now, you can look back on this day as uh, um, uh, not the best day, but that in the in the day two or three years from now, you, you will have succeeded and and can you know, uh, enjoy enjoy that accomplishment. Um, I, I kind of want to. I, I definitely echo. And will echo um, Maureen and Jess's insights. Um, the best way that I looked at it was um, on the reconciliation, uh, which is uh, um, attachment one uh, to the the financials. And we you don't have to go there, but it, to me it, it it tells the story that that has been told already uh, this morning. That um, looking at the 45 million 2021 projection to the 54.6 million 2022 uh, re requested budget. Um, that is a, a 9.4 million dollar increase, with 8.5 um, of it coming from Medicare. So, um, and that 8.5 million dollars is a 77 percent increase um, <clears throat> over the projected 2020, the projected 2021. Uh, Medicare and PR, and that just seems like a huge leap to me. And uh, 
So, but, but trying to kind of walk it back um, of that uh, $8.5 million increase, 6.7 of it is in utilization. And so, um, and maybe this is, uh, you know, tracking on what Robin just, just said, but to be able to track th that increase in utilization back to where your utilization appears to be in, uh, increasing 22 budget over 22 um, uh, <clears throat> projected, you know, in terms of a, a swing administration, swing days, psychiatric administration, go, go back to, I think, slide, thir slide 11. You don't have to go there now. So go back to those increases in utilization uh, that you profiled, uh, which are huge to some extent, and and tie them to this where where it makes sense to this medic recommended Medicare increase. Uh, I just you know I look at this 77% increase amount um, uh, in Medicare, uh, tw you know 20 uh, 22 budget over 20 20. Uh, one projection and it, it just it's just hard to wrap wrap my arms around it. So um, for for me the best the best format to make the case or to profile the moving parts here uh, in a clear way um, is using a table three in um, appendix uh, one, which uh, is the crosswalk from um, twenty one projected twenty one projected to uh, 22 proposed budget. Um, I mean, the, Maureen raised the issues having some issues having to do with commercial, but the net the net commercial is only seventy four thousand dollars. It's it's the Medicare uh, column uh, where um, most of this 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 anticipated uh, maybe aspirational revenue um, is coming from. Um, other than that, I, we don't need to talk about that because it's just you know um, I forget. Forget about the slogan might be beating a dead horse or something, but um, uh, I, I just to me, if you sit there and and, and look at that uh, table three uh, in reckon uh, in appendix one, it becomes very clear the, the very very steep slope that's just hard to get one's arms around. And if we could walk that back to your utilization projected increases, uh, that would be helpful. Um, I do have a couple of other questions. I just want to be clear in attachment seven, um, where uh, it, where on attachment seven, you are still carrying as a liability at the end of this year, the um, Vermont uh, FY20 COVID loan um, at $1.3 million. But I think in the narrative, you've said that that as part of the um, bankruptcy settlements that that uh, that has been um, forgiven and I just want to make sure that is the case. So um, Sean, yeah, to answer your question at the end of fiscal year 20, we had the 1.3 million dollars as a liability on our books. Um, we no longer have that liability per se because of the chapter 11 and um, some of our um, loans with the state were settled. Um, under the Chapter 11 and kind of rolled into a new loan amount that's outside of the, the COVID piece of it. Right. We don't we don't have a liability right now on our books for that. Good thing. Um, so another question is um, in the uh, relative to the Master Shared Services Agreement. Um, in your presentation today, you said that the FQHC is. Uh, uh, contributing in revenues uh, to the hospital, 840,000. Um, I'm just wondering what 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 is the total amount of that agreement? What um, or, or what is the total amount of um, uh, um, you know spending expense uh, across both organizations at play here? So I can get a, some kind of a reference sense of of what the 840 thousand dollars means. Is that you know, 20% of the total, or is it 50% of the total? Um, and uh, is that related to maybe square footage or some other kind of uh, metric that uh, could make more sense out, out of out of that number? Um, and other than that, um, 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 I'm 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 
trying to work my computer here at the same time. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, uh, th those are my questions. And uh, I really hope that, um, you know, this, this conversation kind of, uh, you know, becomes a, you know, a work in progress and that, um, uh, that the efforts that you folks are making will, will bear fruit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so I can you, answer Tom. your, um, I was going to answer Tom's question about um, the 840,000 for the master shared services agreement. So um, that represents um, staff that's employed by Springfield Hospital. Um, it's that that number is just solely for wages. Um, and what that represents is that we have the expense for those employees that are hospital employees. 100% of that expense is showing up under salaries and wages. And for each of those areas that we have shared services, which are many, many different areas, such as um, accounting, um, human resources, engineering, um, materials management, medical records, um, I'm probably forgetting something, but in each of those areas in our master shared service agreement contract, there is a certain percentage um, that is applied, that is allocated um, from the hospital to the FQHC, and that's billed on a monthly basis. And um, that is showing up as revenue to offset the cost that's showing up under salaries and wages. And that's part of the reason um, for the operating expense increase too, is that those employees last year that are shared with the FQHC were FQHC employees in 2020 and transferred over to the hospital um, at the end of 2020. Um, so that's something I didn't think about before, but that um, is part of the reason for the increase in the expenses as well. Because those shared employees are 100% on the hospital's books um, for salaries and wages where they weren't previously before. And the offset for that is showing up under master shared services revenue, which is under other operating revenue. So is, is there a simple way on a one pager just to kind of profile the different moving parts in the master shared services agreement, um, what the dollar value is and what the uh, you know prorated amounts are to the hospital and what remains with the FQHC? Yep. Okay, yep. that'll help, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Kata, I want to focus for a minute on the uh, Wyndham Center, the psych beds. Um, can you tell us uh, what percentage of that is commercial patient patients? Yes. Hold on just a second. Yeah, okay, I think I have the number if you can't put your finger on it. Um. Well, if you're if you're including Blue Cross with commercial, whether you are or not, it's about 16 percent. Without that agrees, Blue Cross, is that 8%. agrees with my number? So, I I just want to uh, give you a chance to flesh out. Uh, someone watching this uh, hearing might think that there's a great opportunity for um, some addition to your operating margins from being able to run the Wyndham Center at um, full capacity, and yet um, when you take a look at it, you book that uh, revenue from the state of Vermont as other revenue, and at the end of the day, how much of a real difference is there in your margin just being contributed from there when I have to assume that because it never operated near um, capacity for uh, strictly COVID operation that your expenses wouldn't be as high as what they would be this year if you truly are able to capture that uh, full projection. So I'm, I'm just curious what the net difference, if you look at the state of Vermont revenues under contract paid to you um, for operating as, as a COVID psych facility versus what you anticipate to um, operate in 22, what's the net uh, operating uh, difference? Um, Kevin, that's a good question and one that we'd have to, you know, do the math on and get back to you. Okay, I, I just ask it because uh, 
I hear some frustration in some of my colleagues on the board because I think that um, they've probably come to a similar conclusion that I've come to that we really haven't seen a sustainable plan for Springfield success and yet we all want to root for it and we all want to see it happen and I, I'm just worried that uh, um, despite everybody's best wishes and efforts for success that unless there isn't some um, radical rethinking and um, strategic planning that we're just not going to get there and I'll just leave it at that. At this point, I'll turn it over to the Healthcare Advocates Office for questions. Thanks, Jermon. Um, just wanted to start off by thanking the team at Springfield, in particular for your vaccination efforts during the pandemic. It's great to read that in your narrative. Um, my first question pertains to free care and bad debt. We observe that your ratio of free care to bad debt has decreased from 2019 actual to 2021 projected. And we're wondering if you could speak a bit more about the causes of those changes and what happened on the ground. Thanks. Kato, do, are you, will you take that slide or you want me to? I thought you were going to do the, the two slides that we had on the. OK, for them. Um, well, thank you. That thank you. That's a that's a good question. We have seen a decrease in bad debt in free care. Uh, one of the things is our robust partnership we have with Valley Health Connections. Uh, they assist with you know getting the uninsured and the underinsured signed up, and so you know that it, those efforts are succeeding in our in our marketplace. Um, you know they've offered multiple special enrollment periods. Um, these are all on our slide on page 32 as well. Um, you know, we, during the pandemic, a lot of patients have chosen to defer care, and we think that that has led to reductions in our bad debt write-offs for uh, deductibles and co-pays as well. And that we've also um, engaged a new vendor to help us with our early out collection processes. So I think we've we've actually improved um, a little bit of our collections in that area. And again, as I mentioned earlier, I think we have some some opportunities around our revenue cycle and we have a team now working to identify those thanks just a brief follow-up on that do you expect these trends to continue into fy22 and beyond you know i don't i, I will i'm not sure that i have that i can project that being so new in the marketplace i would like to think that they are obviously obviously we have a lot of people that are you know in the products and or you know have eligibility you know for the medicaid expansion in the state so i would like to think that this is sustainable but i haven't i'm not sure i've been here long enough to to answer a valid with a valid answer that's okay i understand that mm -hmm. um and I know as we, so we submitted a couple of free hearing questions that focus on race equity i uh, just wanted to give a uh, the opportunity right now, if you want to speak a bit more about your efforts that you do at the hospital. I know Springfield's small, um, but it's an important area, obviously, I think for all of Vermont and all Vermont hospitals. So I just wanted to give you an opportunity to speak more about those efforts. Certainly, certainly. And it is it is an opportunity for us. We have um, an initiative that we we're rolling out in the new fiscal year around improving education for our staff. We've um, committed to a new software program that's going to provide a lot of offerings that we could not produce ourselves locally in-house and it will also allow us to track those and tr make sure everybody is able to complete them electronically you know without being face-to-face -face education so our main our main that achieving that goal is rolled up in that initiative that we're going forward with this year so we will have those programs it will be required of all of our employees and it'll be produced um you know, by a third party, you know, it'll be very, um, it'll be very convenient and easy for our employees to receive that training. That's great to hear. Thanks. Um, last question is just in response to the board's questions, you wrote that it's hard to take on ACO risk, and we understand the different payment structures offered by different payers through the ACO. So we're interested in your perspective on how the risk you would take on through fixed perspective payments would compare the risk you take on through fee for service. Where you get paid for more for doing more obviously but there's more unknowns in your budget than you would be for for fpps thanks well i'll i'll start that question but my financial 
colleagues might have to help me. I think that we answered that question the way we did due to the overall financial situation of the hospital. We felt we should, we wanted to continue with the products we had this year, although we did not feel like we're in a position right now to accept any additional risk until we get the hospital more sustainable. So I'm not sure if Kata has anything else to, to add to that. No, I think you're pretty much um, right on, Bob, that um, with the position that we're in, we just don't want to take on in increased risk at this time. As, as we get as we improve the hospital's financial performance, it's certainly an area that that we're willing to look at and evaluate. Thank you. Those are my questions. Back to you, Chair Mullen. Thank you, Sam. Next, I'm going to open it up for public comment on the Springfield Hospital budget. Is there any member of the public who wishes to offer comment at this time? And I see a hand raised. Tom Hubner. Thank you, Chairman Mullen. Um, my name is Tom Hubner. I am uh, the special advisor to the governor on Springfield Hospital. Um, I have been working with Springfield since December of 2018. Um, I had a few additional comments. Uh, the state of Vermont uh, has done everything we could think of to make it possible for Springfield to have a future. Um, financially over the course of the last uh, two and a half years. We saw them through bankruptcy and continue to have supported them up to and including some financial uh, support just this past June. Uh, very importantly through that process, they cut costs substantially. Um, they looked at every service line to see if it was contributing to overhead margin. It led to the closure of, for example, the OBGYN service line. The service lines that remain open have been contributing to margin um, and to overhead. So it's very difficult to close further programs in order to turn around uh, the situation. Uh, they cut a lot of overhead costs, it's been alluded to already. And very importantly, they maximize reimbursement under current programs, which has not been being done under um, prior administrations. And that's been a part of uh, what's gotten them to where they are today. Um, as part of that effort, we also encourage uh, possibilities of uh, collaboration and merger. Um, and there was a conversation to create a free hospital mini system in the Connecticut River Valley, uh, with Dartmouth being the, uh, the parent organization. Um, frankly, in March of 2020, we are on the, we had a verbal agreement and then COVID happened. Uh, and frankly, Dartmouth uh, put that on hold um, and stepped back for COVID and also to solve some of their own uh, regulatory issues in southern New Hampshire unrelated to Springfield, but where they thought that would have an impact. Uh, to me, that is still a part of a future that we should be resolving or, or looking towards. And Springfield has added a board member from Dartmouth uh, uh, to their board so that there is an ongoing avenue for communication uh, and going forward. Having said all that, um, uh, the, the Mountain Care Board is correct that things are still extremely fragile. Um, my own view is that it is not an expense problem and there's very little additional expense that can be cut it is a revenue and scale problem. Um, and uh, what my work with the uh, Springfield folks has been doing is they are providing uh, to me and to the Agency of Human Services um, cash flow projections with different volume assumptions. Um, uh, and uh, uh, that uh, with different uh, volume assumptions, sorry, um, that will allow them to create strategies to make sure they can be achieved. Uh, in the end, um, they have to stabilize those programs as um, I think, Jess, you said, they have to uh, attract people who are going by their front door or have. Um, and they, there is some early evidence in the last few months of that happening. Whether it happens sufficiently or not, frankly, time will tell. Uh, but it's my view that that's where the uh, focus of their energy needs to be is ensuring that their market share is maximized. 
um, because that is really uh, the most likely possibility for them to get into a stable situation. Finally, I would add that stability is probably a necessary component of further discussions with outside partners. Um, and if that is not achieved, um, then, then it's much more difficult. So uh, their focus is rightly on stabilizing those programs and making sure um, that people are not passing them by and seeking services there. And I think that is where the most opportunity uh, opportunity lies. I, I should say, by the way, that there is also a representative from UVM on their board. Uh, Dr. Shapiro was um, sitting on their board as well. Um, if anybody has questions with me, of course, I'm happy to answer. Does any board member wish to ask uh, Tom any questions? So, Tom, I guess uh, the, the basic question that I have is, I, I hear what you're saying, you have to improve market share, and I get that. And the only way that Springfield is successful is if their community supports their hospital. That's the bottom line. Um, if they're bypassing Springfield to go to other hospitals in the region, then it's not going to be a success. And I just wonder at what point, since um, you're looking at the bigger picture for the state of Vermont, um, is this just um, a struggle to increase volumes from a number of smaller hospitals on that uh, Connecticut River Valley, both on the Vermont side and the New Hampshire side? Yeah, and, and I mean, that was what the whole mini uh, system conversation was. It was really rationalizing that system um, and, and concentrating different services in different locations, um, both on the Vermont and the New Hampshire side, including services that were going to have to be expanded at Dartmouth um, that maybe could have been provided in those smaller hospitals. So to my thinking, that is still the most rational approach and, and needs to be encouraged, uh, but they also... Dartmouth had their own financial struggles through COVID um, and uh, are, you know, they need to, uh, they're not going to exacerbate their own issues um, if, if, uh, if they don't have to. Thanks, Tom. And I see that Patrick has a question for you. Patrick? Actually, my question is for Bob, Kata, and I believe Mr. Donahue is the new um, Revenue Cycle Director, so good morning all. It's nice to see you, Mr. Donahue. It's nice to make your acquaintance. Uh, as you know, through our meetings the last couple of months with uh, the board chair here, um, I've been asking you a lot about your accounts receivable balances and effective capture of revenue through effective revenue cycle management, because we've been watching those balances month over month go up. And we've been watching your cash balances month over month come down. So when we combine operational losses and ineffective capture of revenue, it's to be blunt, an organization killer. Um, even if you were making a profit of a million dollars a month, an inability to capture um, and bring in that cash to keep cash flow positive and keep um, operations moving can be a major um, inhibitor to your success. So I'm hoping you can enlighten for the board now that you've brought on a revenue cycle director, what your strategic plan is to begin to capture more of that revenue so you can eliminate the focus on revenue cycle management and focus on those operational loss components of your organization. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and speak to that. We have added a new revenue cycle person. Um, Mr. Mr. Donahue is not in that role. He is with QHR assisting us with our um, you know, more strategic direction of the hospital, but we have hired a new experienced revenue cycle director who, who has joined the organization and we have we have initiated a performance improvement process to look at that aspect of the hospital. And I want to just preface that by saying we have a lot of really good people that work in the revenue cycle function at the hospital. Many of them have been here a long time and have devoted their lives to the hospital. So I uh, know they they know what to, they know what needs to be done. But under new leadership with the process, we are put together a team and that team is looking at all aspects 
of the revenue cycle, starting from when the patient arrives and is admitted to the hospital un until the time when we actually file the claim and collect on the account. And so that process is now underway, and we're going to look at each aspect of the process, uh, establish performance metrics, and develop you know action plans. You know the the areas that have opportunities, we will develop plans to um, improve those areas and track those the performance in those areas. Thank you for that. OK, at this point, I'm going to open it up for other public comment. Does any member of the public wish to offer public comment on the Springfield Hospital budget? Hearing none, um, I just want to say that uh, we're going to wrap up this hearing, but that will not be um, the end of the uh, budget proceedings as we're going to hear um, both from the healthcare advocate and from the head of, uh, of VAS on um, perspectives overall on uh, the hospital budget process of this year. And um, so please nobody uh, jump off thinking that the meeting is over. Um, but I do want to thank uh, everyone from uh, Springfield um, for the hearing this morning. And uh, I just want you to know that even so, though some of the questions may seem to have been harsh, we are rooting for you. So with that, I'm going to uh, end the Springfield uh, portion of this hearing and move on to um, some, I guess you might say, concluding remarks um, from both the healthcare advocate and from Vaz. So, um, Jeff, do you, would you like to go first? Sure, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to do that. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I, I'm Jeff Tiemann. I'm CEO of the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. And first, I just want to thank members of the Green Mountain Care Board and the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. As I think I say every year, there's there's only a handful of people who get to enjoy the entirety of these hearings. And I recognize it's a lot of work for the board, uh, for the healthcare advocate, as you consider all this complicated information, for the hospitals that work so hard to prepare their budgets and make their presentations, and then for the people like me who try to listen and process what's happening here and what it means for our healthcare provider community and for our state. Um, at the beginning of this proceeding a couple weeks ago, I opened with some comments to say that hospitals are squeezed like never before. And the hospitals themselves, I think, told you this story over and over for the past couple of weeks. They simply have no extra people, no extra time, and no extra space. They're treating more patients every day, and they're filling their beds and their facilities, not just with COVID, but also with people who delayed care during the pandemic and those seeking treatment for mental health, as well as individuals who are waiting for long-term care placement. All of the patients are presenting sicker and more challenging, and creating an unprecedented utilization challenge. Then we have third doses and 60,000 vaccinations for kids coming up. So hospitals are once again in that business. And they are testing and they're managing the logistics and the issues associated with mandating vaccination for their own staffs. So given all of this, the Green Mountain Care Board graciously said at the beginning of this process that it would entertain requests from hospitals that did not feel as though they had the bandwidth to participate in a hearing. I think it says a lot that despite being so busy and overwhelmed, the hospitals wanted to come tell their story to make sure this board and Vermonters in general know what they're doing and how they're trying to stay strong now and plan for the future. The budgets that have been submitted and that you've reviewed are not overreaching. They represent what is necessary to rebuild, to recruit and to invest in their facilities. These are the budgets Vermont's nonprofit hospitals need to serve their patients and be there for their communities. Our hospitals do not answer to shareholders. They're accountable to the people and the places they serve. And in that spirit, they're requesting budgets that enable them to meet their mission and continue to be leaders in public health during a still critical and really uncertain time. And with so much uncertainty and challenge, reducing or changing budgets would be harmful, especially at a time when all of us need our health system to be safe and strong and to be able to manage the pandemic while still doing the important work to improve access and wait times and to update facilities to meet demand and stay current on technology and equipment. So with that, there were just a few things I wanted to comment on briefly that came up during the budget hearings. 
The first was a couple questions around mental health and what the Green Mountain Care Board can do to help hospitals in this space. To me, the best thing the Green Mountain Care Board can do is to make sure that hospitals have the financial wherewithal they need to invest in the facilities, the services, the people, and the surroundings that are needed to compassionately treat people coming to us for mental health care. More concretely and immediately, the Green Mountain Care Board could expedite emergency CONs for emergency departments and other enhancements that are needed in the system to relieve pressure. I'm happy to provide additional detail about some of the options that hospitals are looking at and the important conversations taking place there. There were also appropriate questions about expense control and good answers, I think, from hospitals that are working hard every day to find new ways to limit cost growth. A point that just has to be underlined here is that hospitals do not control inflation and they do not control skyrocketing pharmaceutical costs. They also do not control the unbelievable cost you've heard so much about of travelers who are unfortunately more needed now than ever with the workforce crisis you've heard so much about. Meanwhile, even with all of this going on, our hospitals continue working to transition to value-based care and doing so without the significant transformation funding that was promised as part of the all-payer model. And this work also involves managing the administrative complexities of participating in our unique health program, health reform program, which require a lot of staff time and focus. To be clear about how hospitals have been vocal on this set of issues, we testified in the legislature on the need for and importance of transformation dollars 11 times since the end of 2018. We have given that testimony to House Health Care, Senate Health and Welfare, and the Health Reform Oversight Committee. In addition, we have included the plea for the state to fund transformation in our legislative breakfasts and hospital specific conversations with local delegations. We've also written letters to this board and had numerous conversations with AHS leadership and our federal partners. So I just wanna be very clear that hospitals have raised their voice on transformation funding early and often, and not just on the need for dollars, but also on the complexity and cultural challenge of moving to a new payment model. It also must be said here that despite the lack of these transformation dollars, hospitals continue anyway to invest in reform and take on significant financial risk. You heard Dr. Joe Paris say that he serves on the AHA Rural Health Task Force and that critical access hospitals in other parts of the country have difficulty understanding how such a small organization can do what our hospitals in Vermont are doing. We are leading the way. So as we complete these hospital budget hearings, I ask that you remember the intense voices and testimony you heard over the past couple of weeks. If our hospitals were to experience a new significant COVID surge in the coming days, it will further stress our facilities and our staffs. And we don't even know what comes after that. So my request today is that as board members, you prioritize public health and access to care during these crucial times, which includes critically making sure that hospitals have the resources they need to get through the pandemic and to emerge stronger than before. Over the past couple of weeks, you heard about a lot of intractable problems, including the workforce and mental health crises. As a regulatory body, I can understand that it may feel like these issues are outside your control or your purview, but the first and most important step you can take to address these challenges is to approve hospital budgets that are crucial for the health and well being of Vermont. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. And please extend our thanks to all your members who did choose to uh, come forward. Um, you know, it was just two weeks ago today that you and I were running around like uh, chickens with their heads cut off trying to figure out how best to proceed with the uh, um, data that was in front of us on uh, the Delta variant. So um, we're really appreciative that everybody came forward and uh, um, had that exchange with the board so that we could ask questions and get a better understanding of of each of the the hospitals so thank them on our behalf please i will do that kevin and thank you for your collaboration on this it's been really important thanks and with that i'm going to turn to the healthcare advocate mike fisher good afternoon you get to uh, have your hospital budget hearings bookmarked by jeff and i um <laughs> So, so uh, thank you to everyone involved in this overall process. Um, I want to just take a few moments to to make a, a few uh, high level points. Two two points really. <clears throat> First, uh, I want to recognize the good work that 
uh, many hospitals reported on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and recognize the substantial work ahead of us on this issue. We would welcome board input and focus uh, on this important work going forward with a goal of developing ways to uh, measure both the efforts and the impacts of those efforts on the ground. <clears throat> Second, um, though bad debt and free care are a relatively small part of overall hospital budgets, we put a good deal of focus here for some obvious reasons. As has come out a few times during the hearings, uh, this year's hearings, uh, we recognize that medical debt often has a real impact on the decisions Vermont families make when they need care. I think we can all agree that when a Vermonter needs care, we want them to be considering the best clinical advice not the sometimes inevitable financial impacts. <clears throat> We've been studying this issue lately through our medical debt storytelling project, and we will have a lot more to say about the inter interaction between medical, medical debt and the right care at the right time. We're not interested in driving up uncompensated care. While it's relatively straightforward for us to look at hospital free care policy, policies and compare them to each other, it's very hard for us to have a real understanding of how these policies play out on the ground. That's why we're focused on the overall amount of bad debt and free care at each hospital. I don't know what the right relationship is. Should it be five to one bad debt to free care or one to one bad debt to free care or somewhere in between? But my point by giving those numbers is that there's a wide range in the Vermont hospital uh, system. As always, we're happy happy to talk to any hospital executive or any anybody from the hospital's uh, system, uh, as well as any member of the board about these issues. Nothing is simple about it. <clears throat> we want to reduce medical debt for many reasons, but a primary one is to help people get the right care, get the care they need when they need it. Thank you, Vermont Hospitals. Thank you, Green Mountain Care Board. Thank you, Mike. And just as a reminder to everyone, the public comment period is open through September 1st, and we continue to uh, look forward to a public comment. Um, after September 1st, we will still be looking at that public comment, but I just want to uh, emphasize how helpful it is if we receive it by September 1st, as we will begin um, starting on the 3rd to have discussions, and um, the quicker we have the public comments, the quicker we can um, really make some firm decisions. All decisions will be made by September 15th um, through the open meeting process, so nothing will be discussed um, outside of that open meeting process. And after all those um, votes have occurred, our legal team will write the written decisions that will be out to the hospitals by October 1st. So with that, I, I want to thank everyone. It's been uh, a uh, uh, tough couple of weeks, um, tough couple of weeks overshadowed by what's going on in the world around us, not only um, on the healthcare front, but on many other fronts as well. And um, we will get through this and come out on the other side, um, hopefully uh, as having learned something collectively. So with that, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. so moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day and enjoy the weekend. <laughs>